I do have a high degree of confidence that the economy will go into recession. And if it doesn't happen, uh, then there will be um, a really, really long list of things that never have happened before that, yeah. that, have, that would have happened, right? Things that historically have signaled recession with, you know, 100% certainty or 90% certainty, all of which will have collectively uh, missed this one. This episode of the Forward Guidance Podcast is brought to you by Wide Sharks. Super happy to welcome back to Forward Guidance, Eric Basmajan of EPB Research. Eric is uh, an economist, economic analyst who focuses a lot on the business cycle. Eric, I'm really happy to uh, have you here. And I just want to say in October, when the Bloomberg recession probability was at 99%, everyone and their mother was you know, expecting that we would have a recession. And I think it's you, I would include you in that group, um, probably myself as well. Since then, inflation has fallen like a rock from, what, 9% in, in June to about 3% now, and U.S. growth has held in there. So is it safe to say this is going to be a short episode, soft landing, right? Can, can we end the episode <laughs> now? Yeah, that's right, Jack. No, I'd love to take you through how I define where we are and, and what's been happening. I just want to say at the outset that I'm a super big fan of your show, and you've made like some unbelievable strides over the last couple of years. So it's great to be on, and um, I'm an avid listener. So keep doing the great work there. You're exactly right that in Q4 of last year, everybody was in the recession camp, and for, for good reason. Most of the uh, recessionary indicators that people generally track, such as the inversion of the yield curve, contracting leading indicators, all signs were pointing towards the economy was descending into a recession. And the economy did get close to moving into recession in Q4 of last year because coincident indicators, things like employment, consumption, income, industrial production, did move down into a 1% range with leading indicators that were contracting, a yield curve that was inverted. And historically, the economy has never skirted a recession with those conditions. And then the recessionary fears were amplified because in March, we had somewhat of a recessionary hiccup that went on with the regional banks, which put in place a credit contraction, which all signs then pointed to the fact that this downward snowball was going to continue to accelerate. But as you correctly point out, we've had somewhat of a remarkable stabilization in broad coincident indicators of economic activity, the indicators that define the business cycle, which, as I mentioned, are your broad baskets of income, consumption, employment, and industrial production. So as far as I see it, I know it it becomes difficult when the length of time has stretched quite quite long here, but I still believe the economy is in one of these pre-recessionary phases with it actually still being, in my view, not data-driven to definitively say that we may not be in the recession now. There's still a lot of indicators that are continuing to point in that direction. In the last jobs report, we saw uh, a pretty significant increase in both the U1 and U3 unemployment rate. So there are a lot of conditions that are continuing to support that the economy is moving on that recessionary process. These things take time. This one has taken longer than normal for sure, definitely longer than I would have expected given the magnitude of the tightening. But the constellation of indicators that I follow are not giving an all clear sign that we can say that the economy has safely avoided recession and will continue on a new up cycle in 2024. So when you look at economic growth, you're talking about income, industrial production, the labor markets and non-farm payrolls, employment level as retail sales and consumption. So let's start with the things that have been the most robust. That labor market, we'll get, we'll get into that in a bit, but just consumer spending. Is it, is it fair to say that Americans have been spending money? And yes, uh, the growth rate of spending is, has slowed down, but people are still spending a, a lot of money and it is nowhere close to recessionary. Yes or no? So I would say, as all economists, right? Yes, but, right? I would say that we have to break out spending into two categories, right? There is the durable goods cyclical type of spending. That is the type of spending that contracts and pulls the economy into recession. If you look at consumption excluding durable goods, which pretty much renders the consumption of healthcare, housing, utilities, food, groceries, 
that type of spending never really contracts, not even in recessionary periods. That type of consumption was positive for the most part of, of 2008. And even in mild recessions, that service-oriented, healthcare-oriented spending doesn't really contract. So what's been durable, no pun intended, is the durable goods, cyclical areas of consumption. They were pushed uh, 20 or 30% above trend uh, in terms of how much the durable goods consumption was stimulated. And there was a large expectation that both because of the pent-up demand hangover of COVID and because of the increase in interest rates, we would have had a larger decline in durable goods consumption than we've had so far. We've seen a decline from peak, but granted that peak was way above trend. So we've seen durable goods consumption flatline from over a year ago, but we haven't seen durable goods contract in the way that they normally do leading into recession. So we're seeing something in the order of one or 2% contractions in durable goods consumption in real terms. Normally, durable goods contracts four, five, six, seven percent in the lead up to recessionary periods. So I would say that the the durable cyclical elements of consumer spending have held up better than would have been uh, projected so far by the pace of monetary tightening and from the leading indicators. Those indicators haven't uh, hooked up. So I would still be in the camp. That type of cyclical spending is on the cusp of turning down. Uh, We do see some evidence of that. But as of right now, the lack of contraction in that cyclical area, in my view, has what's provided more stability than the services-oriented spending that I think most people are referring to. What is the level of increase of retail sales now if you include services and durables? Because there was a really hot print in a month ago, right? Yeah, absolutely. And again, it was mostly concentrated in the cyclical areas, which so that big GDP retail sales print also carried through to the personal consumption numbers that come out at the end of the at the end of the month and we saw the flow through from the retail sales to the durable goods consumption. Mostly it's this motor vehicle area that's continuing to be quite strong motor vehicle parts and and consumption of those types of, in, of goods. It, it supports the fact that the cyclical area of the economy, the one that's supposed to slow down first because of interest rate increases and monetary tightening, that's the part of the economy that's actually been more resilient than some of the, I would say, more predominant reasons we hear about why the economy may be avoiding recession. So in my view, it's much more related to the lack of contraction in the cyclical economy, defined broadly as residential construction, manufacturing, and durable goods, the lack of contraction in that area, as it is the fiscal support to the non-residential construction sector or the consumption of services or the household really hanging in there. In my view, it's really the part of the economy that everyone would have expected to have a large contraction has really not yet. It's still heading there. It hasn't really shown huge signs of improvement, but it's been slowing at a very gradual pace given how fast they tighten monetary policy. And so housing and autos, frequently the sectors that slow down the fastest from interest rates because you're financed with debt for consumers, for mortgages or or auto loans, and both have not slowed down by nearly as much as expected. And Housing, we're seeing a reacceleration, and the explanation, of course, it's always easy to, very easy to come up with a reason why something happened, much easier than it is to predict. But the explanation is all the folks who bought homes, they're locked in with a 3%, 4% mortgage, so they're not moving. They're, it's like a, a, a jail cell for them. So the amount of existing home turnover on the market is so small. So much of the new houses is coming from the new, some, if people want to buy a house, it's coming from the new home market. So that's built by the home builders. And that employs a lot of people for the home building sector. Yep. That's certainly an element of what's going on. I think that there's a secondary factor that I, I personally believe is more forceful at the moment. But maybe I'll just first explain how I believe in my process, how recessionary conditions unfold, which is why I'm very focused on the hang up that's going on in this cyclical sector. So generally, the availability of money and credit tightens from changes in monetary policy, and that affects various leading indicators that we all track. Those leading indicators predominantly foreshadow what's going to happen to the level of activity in this cyclical sector. 
the residential construction, the consumption of autos and durables, and the manufacturing sector, the trucking sector, these parts of the economy. Once those sectors move into contraction, then those industries have to shed their labor. And you start to see job losses accumulate in residential construction, trucking, manufacturing, temporary help. And once you have a sufficient level of job losses in those cyclical areas, those people then become credit stresses. They stop paying on their bills. They stop paying on their mortgage. And only then is that what drags down the non-cyclical or services-oriented parts of consumption. So if you're not having a sufficient contraction in the cyclical economy and you're not having the heavy job losses in those areas, you're really not, it's almost impossible to get the non-cyclical part of the economy to slow down enough to propel the economy into recession, which is why we're focused so much on that area. So one of the points that I would make about what you're saying is we have to break out all the housing data that we're talking about. We have building permits and starts that are more on the leading side. We have the number of units that are under construction, which is a coincident what's happening now. That's what really feeds through to the labor element. How many people is the industry employing? That's how many units are they building? So what we saw was over a year ago, the level of permit activity for single family collapsed. And then the level of housing units under construction for single family fell sharply. So as it stands today, the level of single family construction is about 18% from peak. So we were were building currently 18% fewer single family homes than we were at the peak. That made sense. Leading indicators said it would contract, and then it started to contract. What you're referring to is we're starting to see an upturn again in the building permits, and housing starts of these single families. So that is probably going to translate to a small increase in the number of single family units that are under construction. Maybe we go from negative 18% back to negative 15 or negative 12 as we start building some units. But there's a secondary piece to this, which is the multifamily or apartment units that are under construction. And while we've seen single family construction fall 18% from peak, In that same period, the multifamily under construction has continued to soar. So despite the fact that interest rates have gone from zero to five, despite the fact that multifamily permit activity peaked over a year ago, we have yet to see any contraction at all, even month on month sequentially, in the number of multifamily units that are under construction. So we're still building tremendous amount of multifamily apartments, and that is a very high multiplier sector, just as the single family is, and it feeds through to those other cyclical areas. If you're building a lot of apartments, that means you need a lot of washing machines, a lot of dryers, a lot of refrigerators to go into all of those units. All of those things need to be manufactured. They need to be put on trucks and and brought to the buildings. So there's a huge interconnectedness between that resi construction, manufacturing, and durable goods consumption sector. And in my view, what's going on is that despite the fact that interest rates have gone up really sharply, we've yet to see a durable contraction in multifamily construction. We've actually continued to see an increase. And the fact that sector in aggregate, multi plus single, hasn't contracted you're not able to get the decline in durables and manufacturing and that sort of downward spiral that propels the rest of the economy into recession. We're seeing the very early signs of job losses accumulate in those sectors, but so far they've been mild enough that they haven't affected the broader economy. And does it alter your view at all that single family mortgage delinquencies are exceptionally low? I believe a 50 year low, unlike 2006, 2007, 2008, which it was obviously a crisis that compounded on itself. The credit, the consumer credit angle is actually pretty good. Would you agree or disagree with that? That the US I, consumer I credit is. That. Okay. I would agree with that and how I would fit that into my process. So every data point that we talk about to me always gets sorted into. Is this a leading element, a cyclical element? Is this a coincident indicator or is it a lagging element? And when we talk about consumer stress or consumer credit, typically you need to see 
a shakeup in the labor market, which causes the consumer stress. And since we know that labor is in that coincident indicator bucket, generally you start to see broad consumer stress, usually in the middle or towards the end of the recession. The 08 story in housing where those credit issues appeared really in 07 and things like that, that was a little bit anomalous in terms of how early some of those credit stresses moved. So I would say it's not super surprising to me that we don't have tremendous levels of credit stress, given the fact that we haven't yet seen a material break in the labor market. We're starting to see the early signs of it, and therefore you're starting to see the early signs of consumer stress in auto, in credit card, in things like that. But when it gets to residential and mortgage, that typically comes late with the 08 cycle, maybe a little bit earlier than normal. So we have a little bit of recency there thinking that mortgage delinquencies go up pretty early. It, traditionally, it's it moves a little bit later. Yeah. And it also depends a lot on unemployment rate for sure, but also the value if the value of the house is still high and people have equity in the homes. You're not uh, going to get a lot of defaults. Yeah, or delinquencies. Rising home prices cure a lot of consumer issues because if you're experiencing consumer stress, but like you said, the home price is rising, you could usually refi and get yourself out of some trouble. Where it tends to be more problematic is if you're negative equity and then you have consumer stress and you can't uh, really hit that escape valve, then it becomes more problematic. But we haven't seen large declines in home prices. We've seen pretty much just a... a net basically flat since June of 22. How do you think this business cycle plays out? When do you think the US economy will enter a a recession? When do you think it will be declared? And and how severe do you think it will be? So as I'm following this sequence through, the reason that I'm sticking to the position that I have is because uh, the sequence is continuing to unfold very much in the order in which it always plays out. And when I talk about this order, uh, I am going back all the way to the 1960s. Every recession, inflationary or the more modern ones, does follow this same sequence of events where more leading and monetary and credit indicators start to contract that leads through to more soft and future commitments about about new orders and construction activity. And where we are now in the cycle is we're right about there, where we're starting to see uh, consistent job losses pile up in the cyclical economy. So if you take when the yield curve inverted, which was uh, at the end of October of 2022, since that point, we've had net job losses in trucking, temporary help services, residential building, and manufacturing is basically flat. So we've had basically nine months of net job losses in this cyclical part of the economy. That is what you would expect to happen first. And so how was it that the unemployment rate stayed flat at 3.4, 3.5% while those job losses occurred? And can you be please be precise as was the, jo- the job losses of people were actually let go or they just left and the number of people employed in these industries declined? And also note, yes, the unemployment rate did tick up to 3.8% in the most recent August report. Yep. So good question. So basically what happened was there was just an offset in, in job gains in some of the other sectors for the job losses in the cyclical part, very much to be expected in the earlier parts of the cycle. So you were getting job losses in the cyclical economy in late 2006 and early 2007, but the rest of the economy was adding jobs and stabilizing the broad numbers. But as I was mentioning in the example of how the recessionary process goes, those job losses do end up affecting the broader economy as those people become credit stresses later down the road in their other spending. So we've seen net job losses in the cyclical part of the economy, but to your point, the job losses so far have been quite mild. The basket of cyclical job losses that I track is about 20 million total payrolls. And to give you an example of the numbers, we're seeing, as of the latest report, about a 30,000 decline pace. That pace is picking up. Six months ago, it was negative 5,000. Now it's negative 30. So we're seeing the cyclical part of the employment market start to deteriorate. That is your sign that the rest of the labor market will likely follow suit. And if I take 
broad averages, and I know we've all been in trouble this cycle for using averages, but it implies that based on the way this is tracking, we should see negative payroll numbers uh, in the headline occur something in the area code of around the turn of the year. Keep in mind that reports are a month delay, so the December report will be reported in January. So we're talking about when we receive the reports, it looks like something like January is a possibility for when this stuff would track to the point where it has deteriorated enough where it shows up in the headline figures. And as you point out, I think that the unemployment rate ticking up in the recent report, which was a sizable increase, I think I saw you mention the 0.3% increase is somewhat anomalous relative to history. Uh, I think that does speak to the fact that this process is underway. And it's also supported by leading indicators of employment, of which I track, also hit a new cyclical low in, in August data, which would imply that the cycle that we're seeing play out, even though it's playing out slowly, will continue in the overall direction. Yeah, I think what I found is that every time you have a 30 basis points increase in the unemployment rate, the 12 month forward increase in the uh, unemployment rate is, is 92 two basis points. However, and I for, you know, forgot to add this nuance on Twitter when I posted her on X, was <laughs> that a, a lot of that for the August report was folks coming out, folks entering the labor market. They were not looking for work and now they entered the labor market. So the labor force participation rate peaked up higher. How much slack do you, do you think that can be explained? In other words, the amount of employment can stay flat or even increase. I think the BLS just I had a forecast that employment is actually going to increase by uh, many millions of this year, but that the denominator expands. The unemployment rate is how many people have a job versus the labor force, how many people are in the labor force. And if the labor force expands because people enter the labor force, then the unemployment rate will tick up, but unemployment, the true employment will not. So income could continue to rise. All very valid points. I don't have a precise answer for how much is slack because I think that's pretty hard to tell. But the way that I cross-check all of these indicators is when the jobs report comes out, I don't look at the NFP number or the unemployment rate in isolation. I do what I do for all other areas of the economy is I create a composite basket, a coincident indicator of employment. And what that indicator does is it takes a lot of the metrics that you mentioned, the unemployment rate, the non-farm payrolls, the weekly hours worked, the claims data. So it takes all these different sources and it compiles all of them into one composite basket. And then all of the differences and idiosyncrasies of, we didn't add too many jobs, but the unemployment rate went up and the labor force participation rate went up. All of that kind of gets squared because any given month, all of these things can move in an opposite direction. Sizable changes in the whole basket tend to come together, right? It would be very unlikely that you see the unemployment rate go from three to five, and that not be negative NFP numbers, right? So by tracking the entire basket and pulling in hours, aggregate payrolls, um, unemployment rate, you can get a sense of where the whole basket of labor data is tracking. And that coincident indicator of employment in, in my calculation is growing at a 0.6% uh, growth rate. When that indicator goes negative, the economy is always in recession because that would indicate that uh, an average of payrolls, unemployment rate, hours, all of those things in aggregate are contracting. Of course, some of those metrics are used inversely. So what it tells me is that the labor market is definitely slowing down. The growth rate of that composite is cooling. It's been hovering like the coincident indicator of economic activity more broadly. It's been hovering in this 0.6 to 1% range for a number of months here. But my forward-looking leading indicators of employment would tell us that these tick-ups that we're seeing are real. They're not noise, which is why I expect them to continue. And so your leading index, tell us what's in that and how that works, either for the leading index for the labor market, or you can just put up the chart of your conference board leading index for uh, six months annualized growth rate. We're, you know, If folks are listening to this as a podcast, we're seeing a lot of red bars on the chart right now. It went from positive uh, growth to negative growth for the leading from April of last year. So for over a year, your leading conference board has been 
negative and, and getting more negative. So how would you evaluate the coverage word leading index if it's been negative for, I'm not you know good at math, but when the economy is not in a recession now, and maybe you disagree with this, but Atlanta Fed is forecasting 5.9% GDP, real GDP for Q3. Mm -hmm. So the leading conference board leading index is for the broad aggregate economy. We also have leading indicators of specific sectors like employment. So we can have a leading indicator of employment, which would have different, different components. But in principle, all of the indicators that go into leading buckets aren't supposed to be mythology or indicators that just look good on a chart. They're all just supposed to be indicators that logically and both mechanically have to lead in a sequence. So for example, Jack, a building permit has to come before a unit is under construction. A lot of people will say, maybe the leading indicators don't work this time. In principle, that's like saying building permits won't come before units under construction. There's somewhat of a mechanical element to why the leading indicators lead. And that's not true for every single component, but that's true for a host of the components that are in there, which is why they represent those baskets. What about rate of change metrics? And I'm just making up numbers here that if spending from year two to year one went up 20% and then spending from year three to year two went up 8%, that is a huge decline in the growth rate of spending. So that would be a perhaps a red bar, a negative indicator but that's still 8% spending. That's still a booming economy. And as you, you talked about in the labor market, as well as with spending, we had a huge base effect thing that just made so many rate of change metrics you know, go haywire. Right. Extremely valid point. And what I would say is that we would have to both look at the rate of change and also the level. So when we're looking about at the conference board leading index, as an example, the rate of change peaked probably in 2021 the rate of growth peaked probably in 2021, if my memory is correct. But the level has been declining since the growth rate has turned outright negative. So not only has the growth rate gone from plus 15 to plus two, we're now in negative growth rate. So the actual level of the index is starting to go down and has been actually for, for quite some time. What hard data does this replicate? Because like what, you know, whatever agency. So for example, the, the level of building permits is 20% below its peak. Not the growth rate of building permits, the actual level of building permits is substantially below its peak, which is why that's translating or, or hasn't yet, but is starting to translate to a level of residential construction activity that is starting to come down. So the start of the actual level of residential building employments going down for the last three or four months. So we're, we are seeing job losses in the residential building sector as a result of that level of building permits come down. Another example could be the level of new orders. So we could look at the growth rate of new orders or the level of new orders, and the level of new orders has been coming down as of the last several months as well. So your point is super well taken that the peak in the growth rate cycle certainly occurred in 2021. And certain things in the world changed in 2021 as a result of that peak in growth. For example, a large part of the technology bubble did peak. NFTs, meme stocks, all of this type of stuff, which was absorbing trillions of dollars worth of assets at one point. All of that stuff did peak. There was changes in the relative performance of assets and things like that. But as far as a recessionary indicator, we have to be focused more on the level versus the, uh, the rate of change or rate of direction of growth. The point that I would make is that since 2022, Q4 of 2022, this has moved beyond a rate of change issue because the level of all of these leading indicators and the start of the level of these cyclical indicators has actually been outright contracting. So it's no longer just a rate of change issue. It's actually a levels issue, which is much more of a, it's actually the only definition of a real recessionary contraction. Recessions are level concepts, not rate of change concepts. What do you mean by that? So if the growth rate of the economy goes from 10 to two, the economy won't be in a recession. But if the growth rate of the economy goes from 
two plus 2% to negative 1%, the economy is likely in a recession. Even though the rate of change was smaller, it was the actual level that that declined. But you're saying the, the level of the rate of change as opposed to the difference, the, the change in the, the rate of change. That's right. So if it goes from 10 to nine, not growth rate, if the index level, or just think about it as payrolls. Let's just talk about it as a, as a tangible concept like payrolls. If there's 100 people in the economy and you're adding 10 people a year, you're, you're having 110 people the next year, right? If you add eight people the following year, now you have 118 people, the rate of change is slowing down. You're adding incrementally less people than you were adding the year before. That's not a recessionary concept. The recession is if you go from 118 employees to 116 employees. So it, an outright decline in the number that you're adding rather than just adding them at a slower pace. Big thanks to YCharts for sponsoring today's episode. Lots of exciting stuff going on there. They just launched a new functionality called Proposals. If you're in the investment management or investment advisor business, you need to check it out. It's got all the tools so you can communicate with clients and win new business. It's got a customizable report generator, custom talking points, compliance approved messaging, and seamless personalization options for importing market collateral and firm branding. So it's going to make that communication with your clients, whether they're existing clients or new clients, very seamless. Visit go.widecharts.com slash forward dash guidance or click the link in the show notes to check out this new functionality and you get a free trial. And if you use my link, you get 15% off uh, your initial subscription, but that's only if you use my link. So remember it, say with me, go.widecharts.com slash forward dash guidance. I'm the one who has to memorize it. All you have to do is click on it. So if you're an advisor, why charge communication tools and proposals? It's got you covered. It's going to change the game. If you're an investor or financial researcher, such as myself, that's how I use Y charts every day, looking through the data. It makes it so seamless for me. And uh, yeah, I think that many people watching this now will benefit from Y charts. So check it out. Thanks. Let's get back to the episode. Also important, YCharts is hosting a webinar on September 22nd to show off proposals and its full functionality. The unveiling again is on September 22nd. So click the link in the description for the webinar as well. Where do you think the unemployment rate will peak in this cycle? I wish I had the answer to that question. Um, it's really hard in the process that I have, which is a sequential business cycle process to get specific on levels. Um, because so much of it does depend on what shocks come along the way. So for the best example of that would be in July of 2008, the economy was in a recession, as we now know with historical certainty. However, at that time, nobody had any idea the economy was in recession, and it was actually quite mild based on coincident indicators and things like that. Uh, of course, it then became quite a brutal recession because of various shocks and externalities that happened as a result of the mild recession that was underway. So it, I certainly believe that the unemployment rate will be heading up through the rest of the year and into 2024. I can't give you a gauge of where it will stop because a lot of that will depend, as you've been documenting, how do they handle the commercial real estate issue? How do they handle the response to an unemployment rate that continues to go up? If the unemployment rate goes from three and a half to four and they don't ease policy, that would potentially lead to an even harder landing, as opposed to maybe a quicker reaction function where they start to lower interest rates faster. All of these things are unknown before we go into it. But I would say that in principle, it doesn't matter that much because I'm always trying to provide a rolling forecast of what's going to happen over the coming eight months or the coming 12 months. And directionally, I think the, the, the direction we should be looking is that the unemployment rate should be going up from here. What have you made of the new bull market in stocks? We're very close to the highs reached, I believe, in December of 2021 or, or January 2022. And uh, yes, it doesn't seem like it's slowing down. The outperformance of stocks, which are economically sensitive to bonds, which are the opposite, has been very dramatic, especially the long end of the yield curve has uh, bond yields have gone up. If you are someone, I don't know if you are, who says, I listen to what the market is, the market is uh, forward looking, tell me what the economy is doing. Mm -hmm. If the bond market was rallying while the stock market was crashing, that would say, hey, the market's worried about a potential recession. But we have the opposite. 
a buoyant right. stock market and uh, bond yields, uh, bond selling off. So yields up. What do yeah. you think about that? So um, what I would say is that obviously a super large part of the equity performance, almost all of the equity performance has really been concentrated in seven large technology stocks, which are not that cyclical. If you look at the way that they've performed over the last several years, they just eat a larger and larger share of total GDP. But if you look at any index that doesn't really contain those sectors, so IWC micro caps, IWM small caps, we're talking about 2000 stocks here, not a small group. Those sectors remain 20 to 30% from their highs. They haven't really rallied at all. And in past cyclical upturns, it is those small and micro cap stocks that actually outperform the large mega cap blue chip stocks. So to me, this rally has been extraordinarily forceful. It's probably what been one of the most breathtaking rallies I've seen in, in the technology sector specifically. But as I'm sure many of your previous guests have pointed out, it's extraordinarily narrow to just a couple of these stocks. And when you look at any index that doesn't contain the big five, they actually are still 20% or even 30% from their all-time highs, not really rallying at all, not indicative of an economy that is accelerating. We could also check other asset classes. So when the economy uh, enters a cyclical upturn, there is generally a broad group of, of assets that perform similarly. If the economy was entering a new cyclical upturn, let's say from 2016 to 2018, not only do you see small and micro cap stocks perform, usually outperform, but you also see industrial based commodities like copper perform well. And you also see industrial or commodity centric currencies perform well, like the Australian dollar, New Zealand dollar, Chilean peso. And what we're seeing is these cyclical currencies are getting hit very hard, often making new cyclical lows. The industrial commodities like copper, zinc, and a broader basket like rubber and cement that are a little harder to track those haven't really been increasing. In some cases, they've been declining. And you haven't seen a huge outperformance of small and micro cap and more economically sensitive stocks. So the rally is enormous. And it certainly has dragged up the S&P 500, which at the end of the day is a huge barometer for most people in asset markets. But cross asset class, broad looks at markets as a whole, to me, are not indicative of the economy entering a, a refreshed cyclical upturn. So I think bear markets end and bull markets begin in a very narrow way. It often is, as it was on March 23rd, 2020, Apple, Google, NVIDIA lead, leading the charge. And then you have the more mid caps and then the small caps. And then suddenly what, that, that, that's when all the SPACs go public on the TV channels. And that's the, the way it works. I wouldn't disagree with you that this rally has been somewhat narrow, but a very interesting gentleman on Twitter, gentleman, he made an interesting point that actually the Magnificent Seven, like Google and Apple are not in the top 20 performance performers in the S&P 500. And he got like Royal Caribbean, the cruise line company up 100% this year. I um, noticed you didn't mention NVIDIA. Yeah, it, General Electric up 72%. <laughs> so it's really the, the Magnificent One kind of, Magnificent Two, N NVIDIA and Meta, Pulte. So, so you got some home builders, some stuff, and then financials, that sector, I'm gonna really talk about the banks, economically sensitive. So them selling off does not indicate a lot of health about the economy. However, the credit quality, the realized losses on bank balance sheet, it's almost entirely, mostly due to interest rate losses. So they bought bonds at a time when the, econ when the economy, bonds were pricing in a weaker economy and the economy outperformed and the Fed raised rates 525 basis points. And as a result, the, their bonds collapse in value. So it's, I feel like it's, if you say, oh, in 2007, that's when XLF or the bank index started to falter. Yes, the bank index has faltered this year, but it's for entirely different reasons. And that, that's why that is a, a key uh, critique of the traditional oh, high interest rates cause a recession, which I'm not necessarily disagreeing with you, but it's that high interest rates cause pain. Often those are on borrowers if it's short term floating rate debt, but if it's long term fixed rate debt, made at low rates, it's actually the pain is felt by the lenders. It's, so it's felt by the banks. It's felt by you know people who bought like a, long, a lot of long-term bonds, individuals, foreign countries who did, and the Federal Reserve, who is owning all of this 
long-term paper. And I've, in my mind right now is going through the idea that you've, you listened to the show, so you've heard me say this idea. You're, you're well-prepared. Number one fan. Yeah. There's been a lot of money printing just because a lot of those losses have been swallowed by the, the Federal Reserve. And yeah, so what do, we, what do you say about fiscal stimulus, both in the terms of fiscal deficits, but right. also just the fact that when interest rates are higher, there's more money printing to, to pay yeah. off. So yeah. what I wanted to jump in there and say is I have a slightly different view of why high interest rates cause recession. You you took it at, from the perspective of existing money that's out there, existing borrowers that are out there, and the stresses that they'll experience from maybe a refinance or something like that. In my um, in my process, in my way of looking at the world, it's the diminishment of the marginal unit of activity that creates the recession. It's because it's not because of what happens to the existing borrowers. It's what happens to that next project that doesn't get initiated because it's no longer feasible under new interest rates, which then causes that company to have excess labor and they have to get rid of it. And then once that excess labor is purged, those people become credit stresses on the existing borrowers. And that's my feeling of how it plays out. So I think it's more about the marginal unit of activity getting shut off because when we think about real growth, that's basically the number of units that we're consuming or producing. And a recession is producing or consuming less units, number of units going down. So it's really much, it's really the marginal unit of activity that doesn't get done that drives the recessionary process. And what we're seeing now, what I was articulating in the beginning is that despite the interest rates being very high, that marginal unit of activity hasn't really fully rolled over yet. Once that does, I think that you'll start to see the credit stresses appear in the banks, in some of the people that are holding private assets. But that is going to be an artifact of the labor being shed from these more cyclical areas that suffer from that marginal unit of activity no longer being economically viable. What's your view on banks now and the volume of credit? Like bank loans and leases has you know, somewhat flatlined since January, still still up uh, year over year. But I wonder is some of that just so many people who wanted to people who wanted to get a mortgage they they got one already, and so they don't need it. So it's the demand of credit, not necessarily the supply of credit. And yet, no one wants a seven percent mortgage rate. It's I, banks are tightening standards, but it's not as if banks are unwilling to make a 7% mortgage rate to someone who can pay it off. They would love to. It's just that no one's really coming out, out their door. That's, that, that, that's right. So I would say that we've seen bank credit contract in aggregate since basically Q4 of last year. A lot of that contraction has come from the securities side of bank credit rather than the loan portion of it. Which And that's not real bank credit. That's just, that's, it's called bank credit, but it's not an economically sensitive thing. If a bank, if JP Morgan buys $10 trillion worth of US treasuries, it, that's not s- stimulative. You know what I mean? It's, and if they sell a trillion or if they sell 10 million, it's not. It's not stimulative, but it, it, I would say that if they sell, someone else has to absorb that. And to the extent that we know that the Federal Reserve is not absorbing that, it does push tighter conditions throughout the economy. It, I think that's actually what we're seeing now is, the dollar is going up and you're seeing interest rate pressure throughout the economy. And that does, I think, in my view, amplify some of the tightness of credit that's going on. So if banks were were buying a, t- a ton of securities and that was keeping interest rate pressure uh, or interest rate volatility low, that it is in a way somewhat stimulative or more so than it is that they're not shedding securities. So those securities have to be absorbed by somebody. I know that in some worldviews, it's always going to be the Fed. And that may be true, but at the moment it's not. So I think that there is a tightening of financial conditions that comes from banks reducing their securities portfolios in just an effort to shrink their gross balance sheet altogether. I'm sure you've talked to a lot of people in the banking industry. There's not a huge willingness of banks to go out there and grow their balance sheet. So in my view, what they're trying to do is they're trying to keep their balance sheet flat by reducing securities and replacing them with higher yielding loans. That is potentially a good idea because it'll help them reprice their asset books higher. But we have to consider, are they increasing their credit risk by swapping securities for loans 
at a time when the economy may be about to experience some more credit losses? That's an open question. So I think that there's a game that's being played between banks trying their hardest to reprice their asset books as high as they can, while also trying to maintain some sanity around how much credit risk they're willing to bring on. Yes. And as de- deposit rates are going up, on the one hand, they have to make all these higher, they have to make a lot of loans to, to maintain their NIMS or to stop their NIMS from going down a ton. But also they are shrinking their volumes of loans a lot. I guess as some deposits are leaving the banking system. So they would have to fund that with new borrowing, which they would get from at 5% or maybe even 6%, which is un- unattractive. I would say, and I, you know, I, I haven't you know, done a back, a back test to, to know this, but I would say that a bank's ba- banks not making mortgages or car loans, and that is obviously recessionary or contractionary, but banks selling securities like treasuries or agency mortgage-backed securities, I don't, I, I, on the margin it is, but it, it's not, I would say it's much less economically sensitive, but that matters for the world of securities. You're exactly, and- you're exactly right, Jack. You're exactly right. And what I would say, again, just going back to the framework, and, and when we do these historical back tests, bank lending, specifically in nominal terms, is an extraordinarily lagging indicator. In fact, it's listed in the conference board lagging economic indicator. So the process or the sequence that generally plays out is Usually, you get a decline in the liability side of the bank balance sheet, the deposits. Then they uh, shrink their asset books, usually starting with securities because they're less accretive to the profitability of the bank. And they're easier to sell. That's right. So I think what we're seeing is the liability side, the deposit side is moving down. They're having to replace that with higher cost borrowings. And the next step is they usually try and wind down securities and replace them with loans. And then once credit problems start to emerge, they obviously have to shut off the loan book altogether. I think that it's correct to say that we haven't seen loan books contract in aggregate. The growth rate has come down. Like you said, it's maybe flat over the last six months or so. But if that category did turn down, that's evidence that the economy is already in a recession. It's something that occurs quite late. You're totally right. Yeah. Bank lending peaks into a recession and... Or, and credit card data, it's even worse. Credit card data is at its peak or, or in terms of the growth rate at the mm. end of a recession. So like yeah. everyone was borrowing the credit cards in 2009. So right, you know, right. folks talking to me on, on X and they yeah. were saying like, oh, credit is going to collapse. It's, no, it's, it increases into a recession. And, and I think a lot of that, Jack, also is because it's, we have to remember it's a nominal data series and we know that inflation is lagging. So you can, you can improve the, the lag time by looking at real bank credit or real bank lending. But even still, it does lean towards a, towards a lagging indicator. Some of that is just inflation, right? Because if inflation is 4% and a bank grows its loan book 3%, they're supporting less economic activity. It's just at higher prices. You said that typically bank lending gr- grows into a recession, but that it's the bank liabilities are shrinking. So that makes sense in this cycle because money's leaving leaving the banks to go to higher yielding money market funds, ca- cash markets, stuff like that. But in uh, 2020, and as well, really 2008, 2007, w- w- was that also the case? I guess you're looking at a historical basis, which goes back to the 60s. I'm- yeah, yeah. You usually almost always see a, a contraction in the deposit line item of banks or a slowdown in that line item before it comes through the asset and, and loan side. So uh, almost in all historical cases. And to get even more clear, one of my one of my mentors, Lacey Hunt, has popularized the other deposit line item in the bank balance sheet. Other deposits is basically total deposits and strips out CDs or time deposits. So what we're seeing now is that if you look at the H8 report, it looks like deposits are stabilizing at these banks. But what it really is, is just a vertical line of CDs because they're offering 5% and other deposits, which are the most profitable engine of the bank, are actually continuing to go down. So that other deposit line item almost always precedes a decline in the asset side of the balance sheet, even in, in in prior recessions like that. So that's what I think is happening. That's really interesting. Why is it you think that banks funding of non-interest bank deposit are super low, Bank of America checking account deposits, that being replaced by CDs, 
precedes a recession. Because if anything, I would say, look, if I'm if people are giving me money for zero percent, I can just just cash on. I'm not going to take a lot of risk, and that's not going to be economically stimulative. But if I have to pay four percent, five percent for deposits, I'm going to be making as many car loans and credit card loans as I can. You would be better served talking to a banking expert on this. I know you have contacts to a lot of them. The risk speaking out of turn here. But with that caveat, I would think that when a bank offers a CD to, to a client, the CD rate is usually slightly below the prevailing interest rate on those securities that the bank is usually going to offset them with. So I think that those products, they're harboring that pretty weak spread that risk-free spread. And with the other deposits, they are making more long-term type investments. So I, I personally think of it, and I could be entirely wrong here. I would really, I'll be listening to one of your future episodes to see if you cover this. But I think that when there's a huge flood of demand for CDs, they are buying a lot of the short-term paper that's needed to fund those securities. I don't know how much of it is a huge rush of clients demanding CDs, and then they're taking that inflow of deposits and lending it out for mortgages or autos. I don't know the answer to that, but I feel like, in my understanding of it, is that they would match that asset since they're going to be rolling every three months or something like that. And that other deposit line item, the one that they're still able to pay zero or one or two percent, is the core funding of the bank that they use to, to fund more of their profitable ventures. Because a lot, because a lot of those they try and are relationship deposits, right? There, there. You put the deposits here, and in exchange for that, we'll give you X. And they, and that tends to feel like it's a very sticky type of deposit. I mean, First Republic made a mortgage to Mark Zuckerberg at one percent, and and they're pretty confident he wasn't going to pull his money if they offered him that rate in exchange for X amount of deposits. Yeah, I'm eighty percent sure his First Republic could have been SVB, but I'm, I'm pretty sure it was. And again, I, I, I'm speaking definitely way outside my area of expertise. So someone will, I'm sure, correct me on that. But it's an interesting question. I believe that the the reason that Lacey focuses on that other deposits line item is because it is the core funding mechanism for the banks. And that time deposit CD area is generally not. But we'll leave it to an expert more suited than myself. Yeah. So it seems like you're very confident that the U.S. will enter a recession by Q, definitely 2024. But in terms of the, the timing, how soon do you think the dominoes are going to start falling? Because What do you think the odds are? You talk again in February of 2024, and the economy has slugged along, and re, you know, uh, real retail spending is maybe flat. Maybe it's a little bit po- positive if the price of oil doesn't skyrocket or something like that. And that we're still, it will still be arguable about how much the slowdown ha- has been. And it will be an arguable point between thinking people or how confident are you when we do an interview, let's say in February, that it's like, oh, wow, yeah, Eric, it happened. And it's continuing to happen. I do have a high degree of confidence that the economy will go into recession. The timing of it is hard to say because we tend to think of the timing of a recession as an event. If we, if this in September of 2007, and then you interviewed me in February of 2008, you'd still probably grill me and say, hey, nothing has happened yet, even though we were inside the recession. Although a month later, Barrick Stearns would have failed. Exactly. And it still didn't really shake people's confidence that much because the S&P rallied to within 8% of its all-time high in May of 2008. So the point that I'm trying to make is that we all collectively won't agree that a recession is unfolding until we have the quote unquote event that the recession will be defined by Lehman Brothers or or whatever it ends up being. But that didn't happen until September. If you look at FOMC transcripts in July of 2008, They were still talking about how they may have to raise interest rates. The economy looks like the worst is behind us. So it's hard to put a timeline out there because we could very well be inside the recession already. We could be inside the recession in February, but we could have potentially not had the quote unquote event. Um, But I would be very surprised if by, let's say, February of next year, we have another interview and we don't see directional deterioration in all of the indicators that really matter 
like payrolls, like the unemployment rate, and all the things that come with that. In terms of timing, I would be able to offer my opinion in that by that time horizon, by the time we get to January, February, March of next year, I do think that we'll be inside a recession, whether it's recognized or not. And I still, as crazy as it sounds to, to, to you and some of your listeners, I still reserve the, the possibility that the economy is in a recession already because we have a host of indicators that have never before missed. So for example, gross domestic income, the corollary to gross domestic product, has been a more reliable indicator of recessions than GDP. What is GDI? And then what does the difference mean? GDI is gross domestic income and GDP is gross domestic product. So if you go out there and you spend money, GDP is capturing your spending. GDI is capturing the income from the person that you gave your money to. So in theory, they're supposed to capture the exact same thing. They're supposed to be one for one. They're, they're not. There's a small difference, which is called statistical discrepancy, just based on the methodologies and the way they collect the data. That discrepancy obviously closes as the data is revised over the years. But GDP and GDI are supposed to be identical. There's no reason why you would preference GDP over GDI other than GDP is released a month earlier, which is why everyone uses GDP versus GDI. The NBER says that you're supposed to average the two of them together to get the most accurate reading. And the year over year level of real GDI is negative. So GDI is lower today than it was a year ago. Adjusting for inflation, yep. Adjusting for inflation. If you pull your chart back, if my memory is correct, there has never been an instance where GDI has been negative on a year over year basis without the economy being in recession. And I believe GDI has contracted on a year-over-year basis for three consecutive quarters. So this isn't just a a one-off contraction. There's a sustained contraction in gross domestic income. Gross domestic product is saying something entirely different, certainly the Atlanta Fed number. But all I'm saying is that GDI is one of the indicators that's listed on the NBER website as something that they use to help them define this process. So there are several indicators that have been historically incredibly reliable that do spell a possibility that the economy could be in a recession at some point in 2023. It's not a condition that payrolls have to decline before the recession. In order for there to be a technical recession, payrolls do have to decline, but they don't have to decline in the beginning or middle or even before the recession. There are instances like 1974 is the biggest one where payrolls didn't have their first negative reading for up to eight months into the recession. That's my general view of kind of the rough guidelines of when this thing will be dated. I think it's possible it's in 2023. I would be surprised if by February of 2024, we don't have a continued directional deterioration in more of these big indicators like payrolls, unemployment rate, production, consumer income, and things like that. So what, what is the difference between real gross domestic income like in terms of how it's calculated and, and how can you explain that discrepancy? So the, the discrepancy they chalk up to calculation differences and the way that they're sampling the data, and that discrepancy gets pretty small once the data has a chance to be revised. But it's just the opposite side of consumer spending is the best way to think about it or the easiest way to think about it. If you go to the store and you buy a chocolate bar, you're consuming one chocolate bar and that chocolate bar is counted in GDP. We measure up the level of consumption that's going on in the economy. But the store owner who sold you that chocolate bar, he's receiving income from your purchase. So gross domestic income goes down the economy and adds up all of the income received in the economy and gross domestic product. And this is obviously a super simplistic explanation. Gross domestic product is lining up all of the expenditure side of the equation. So every expenditure is an income for somebody, which is why in principle, they're supposed to be exactly the same. They do have differences because there's a lot of complexities with income. It's not so easy as just consumption, right? You have 
dividend income, you have capital gains income, you have all these different types of income that can be hard to capture. And then same thing on the production and consumer side. We're dealing with things like depreciation and inventories and all these things that are non-cash items. So it does get quite complicated, but in principle, they're supposed to be exactly the same, which means that there should be no preference for an analyst to prefer GDP over GDI, other than one is released a month earlier than the other one. Just looking back, sometimes if there is a discrepancy, real gross domestic income is higher than real gross domestic product. The fact that there's such a discrepancy now in the other way what you know how, how can you ex- ex- explain that like with within this cycle is it because gdp is calculated with inventories and gdi doesn't use inventories or so it, it's hard to say but i i read one paper that attempted to sort sort out the difference and it is a plausible explanation i don't dig into it with this level of granularity but it seemed to be somewhat impacted by capital gains because you had big stock market increase with lots of capital gains in 21 big decline in stock market, no capital gains at all in 2022. So there is huge fluctuations in capital gains. And that is something that happened even in the 2001 scenario. That capital gains line item was shifting quite rapidly because of the the tech bubble. And that does impact the income calculation. So that does look like a, a possibility for some of the discrepancy. There's also issues with the way that the aggregate income that comes from the jobs report. You could take income and wages and you can add that up. That data gets revised and that data gets revised on a benchmark basis against what's called the quarterly census of employment and wages. That quarterly census, which I'm sure you've seen, put out preliminary estimates for whether the non-farm payrolls numbers will be revised up or down. And there are preliminary estimate was that the numbers will be revised down. So there could be an overstating on the GDP side. There's a lot of different factors that play into it, which is why best practice is to average the two of them together, the average of real GDP and GDI. And if you go to your FRED database, they actually provide that for you. There's a line item that says average of real GDP and real GDI, and that is the most accurate measure. It's what the NBER uses to define recessions. They don't use GDP or GDI. They use the two of them together. And on that basis, it does indicate that the economy is much closer to recession than prevailing wisdom says at the moment. Conventional wisdom has shifted from definitely recession in Q4, definitely in Q1 when Silicon Valley to, to now definitely not, when a lot of the indicators that are used to define this recessionary process are not a whole lot different from Q4 than they are now. Thanks for explaining that, Eric. I think it was sometime in Q3, Q4 of 2022, someone on Twitter said, oh, the Fed's going to raise by 50 basis points or something. And I think it was 75. Like I had a feeling it was going to be 75. And that was not some genius call by me. It's just that the market was pricing it in at a 92% probability. And I knew the Federal Reserve would let us know if they had a, you know any other plans. So I think I said on this program, or I think with my, the co-founder of BlockWorks, Mike Ippolito, that if the Fed didn't hike by 75 basis points or, or whatever they did end up hiking by, I would end up eating grass <laughs> like on the program. Like I was just so confident. Currently, the market's assigning like an 80% weighting to 75 basis points and a 20% weighting to 100 basis points. I'm in the camp, Mike, I'm so confident it's going to be 75 basis points that if it's 100 basis points, I'm going to eat grass on camera for the pleasure of, of our viewers. Do you have that level of confidence that by, let's say, the end of 2025, the NBER will have declared a recession in the US? By the end of 2025? Correct. Yes, I, I have a high degree of confidence in that. And if it doesn't happen, then there will be a really long list of things that never have happened before that, yeah. that, that would have happened, right? Things that historically have signaled recession with 100% certainty or 90% certainty, all of which will have collectively missed this one, which I guess is a possibility considering we're coming off of a, a specifically unusual period. But I would be incredibly surprised if with that generous length of time, which is certainly fair to put my feet to the fire on that, I do think that we'll have experienced a, a full business cycle recession in the US. Is there going to be any time next year in 2024 
what would have to happen for you to change your mind and say, actually, wow, like the economy is strong. And what happened in from Q, from 2022 to 2023, that was just a mid cycle slowdown and the boom is here. I would have to see, I would have to see a broad based acceleration in all of the leading and cyclical indicators that foreshadow what's supposed to happen in the rest of the economy, which is why I've preserved the stance that I've had. It's that, as you pointed out in some of the charts that we were looking at, not only have we not seen a broad based improvement in these leading indicators, the growth rate has actually continued to get worse and has stayed at extraordinarily deep levels of contraction. So it, it confirms to me that the slowdown in the more broader coincident indicators is still to come. If we saw accelerations and broad baskets of these leading indicators came out of negative territory and started rising, that would give me a lot of pause and say, hey, look, the, the broader economy is probably going to start to accelerate if the recession hadn't already occurred by then. But given the fact that we're not seeing those huge levels uh, of improvement across the broad basket, it keeps me grounded in the fact that I still think that's going to happen. And I would point out that while I do serve asset manager clients, I, I serve uh, a large part of my business is corporate clients that are in this cyclical types of economy. So manufacturing companies, trucking companies, steel companies, things like this. And while we all have to, when we're dealing with asset markets, we wait for the quote unquote big crash to signal that we're in recession. As I was mentioning, it's empirical that trucking companies have lost jobs. Manufacturing companies are shedding jobs. The only reason that they would do that is obviously if their business has slowed significantly. So if I was to have a consultation with them now, it wouldn't do them much benefit for me to tell them that the economy is going to slow from here. It has already started to play out in a big way in their sectors, which is why this process is, is beneficial outside of asset markets. In fact, it can be used quite effectively for corporations that move a big ship that takes a while to turn. If your industry is experiencing job losses now, the time to prepare for that was certainly six or eight months ago, which is when the leading indicators first began moving into contraction. So there are a lot of people in those sectors that are, are fully experiencing recessionary type conditions that had to act in a time frame that was actually roughly consistent with when some of this leading data started to move into contraction. In asset markets, we're predominantly dealing with more lagging type indicators because they are generally more keyed off of what happens to employment data. And to the extent that the broad employment data doesn't deteriorate, you're not going to get uh, huge reactions from the Fed and asset markets. So I just wanted to put that out there that while asset markets are certainly one part of the world, there are a large group of people that run businesses with fixed assets that um, move quite slowly just by nature of the businesses that they have. And these types of businesses are, are uniquely positioned to use these types of leading indicators because whether the asset market trends oscillate from recession to no recession to recession, the corporations are generally much more sensitive and true to what's actually happening in the economic data where the markets can gyrate wildly in both directions moving from one side of the boat to the other. And we certainly, without question, have some of those processes beginning in some of the more cyclical areas of the economy. And I'm sure if you speak to people in those sectors, they'll, they'll attest to that. So I just wanted to mention that it's not just asset markets that this economic process is designed for and used for. There are a lot of applications for this. And we tend to always say, when is the recession going to come? And a lot of times that's phrased around when is it going to impact me and what I care about. And for most people, that's the S&P 500 and their job, which is a more, you know, little bit later into the process. By the time it affects those things, the process is well underway. So very good point. But the last thing you said, aren't asset markets supposed to be leading for recessions? Like the, it's very common for the stock market to start to decline before a recession starts and it, it bottoms before the recession is over. You make a good point and I'll put some nuance around that, Jack. When So stock prices are contained within the leading indicator group and you're certainly correct about that. 
But there's a nuance to if you go and you do the breakdown of stock prices and recessions, what you'll find is that stock prices are not a great leading indicator at business cycle peaks, but they are an extremely reliable and consistent leading indicator at business cycle troughs. And when you average the two of them together, on, on balance, they tend to be a you know two to three month lead time over the business cycle. But that is generally constituted of an average of basically no lead time at business cycle peaks and a pretty reliable two to three month lead time at business cycle troughs. So stock prices are generally much more reliable at picking up the troughs than they are at the peaks. I think in the 1990 recession, I want to say the stock market made a new all time high inside the recession, but you'll have to fact check me on that. I'm sure you're right about the fact that it's much better at predicting troughs than it is at peaks. But okay, so yeah, so I've got a chart just looking at right now at construction, manufacturing and transportation and warehousing and construction actually employment looks pretty good. Again, it's a seasonally adjusted basis still growing for sure. Manufacturing has flatlined and transportation and warehousing has started to exhibit some modest declines. Would you say that's that's accurate? And uh, yeah, what motivates your view that they'll continue to just be very bad just based on what you're hearing from on the ground? No, I don't use any anecdotes to guide where we're going. I would say that all the data you quoted is correct with one nuance is that construction employment encompasses both residential and non-residential. Non-residential is lagging, residential is leading. So if you break out the residential, it's actually starting to contract where the non-resi is actually still quite strong, which is what you would somewhat expect. Um, So it's a little bit of a nuance there. And my view on where those categories are heading is solely based on what I see in both the leading indicators of the broad economy, but also the leading indicators of employment, some of which we talked about the weekly hours work, the temporary help services, the decline in corporate margins and things like that. So the fact that we're seeing leading indicators of the broad economy and of the employment market specifically hold in contraction, I think that the cresting and beginning of a decline that we're seeing it makes a lot of sense and should continue given the fact that we don't see huge accelerations in the indicators that foreshadowed the fact that these would start to roll. Got it. So we, t- we talked a lot about the stock market's role as a leading indicator for the economy. What about the bond market, which on a historical basis, 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, was a pretty good indicator for where the economy was headed. So the b- bonds have been selling off. Are you bullish on bonds right now? Where If the 10-year rally is 100 basis points, is the two years still where it is? In that case, we would have some extreme inversion. So yeah, what do you think about short-term rates, long-term rates, and then the difference between them? So interest rates can be a leading indicator of the economy, but it depends how you're using them. So I would say the yield curve is a reliable leading indicator of the economy that held true in decades of the past, and I believe that it will hold true today. The nominal level of the 10-year bond, for example, isn't always a good leading indicator of the economy. In fact, it's usually quoted as a lagging indicator because it's very sensitive to inflation and Fed policy, which tend to move late. Take uh, an example of the 2018 episode. Bond prices or interest rates were rising through October, November of, of 2018, and they only started to rally quite aggressively really at the end, like December of 2018, and then all the way into 2019 as the Fed started cutting interest rates. Leading indicators had peaked and started declining at the end of 2017 and all through the beginning of 2018. So bond price or interest rates don't tend to be a super reliable leading indicator of the economy. They tend to react pretty strongly to to Fed policy. So the view on interest rates, in my view at this stage, with the curve extraordinarily inverted, has to be basically a view on where you think the Fed funds rate is going to be in 2024 on an average basis. And broadly, I would say that my view is that what's priced into the interest rate curve in 2024, in my view, I think is higher than what's ultimately going to be realized. So I don't have a, a super precise view at this moment of when the first rate cut will come. But if my view of the recession uh, in 2024 comes true, then it's hard to see how interest rates aren't lower than what's priced into the curve, given that I believe the market's saying that rates at the end of 2024 will be 
somewhere in the area code of four and a half percent still. It would be it would be historically uh, a first for the economy to have a recession with interest rates only declining 100 basis points on Fed funds. So if that view of what's priced into markets materializes, I think that's a soft landing type view where the Fed cuts rates 100 basis points, the economy stabilizes, and rates are still at a very high level. So given the fact that I, I believe that the economy is going to experience a full business cycle recession, I have to say that interest rates, based on that prediction, look to be priced too high for what's in 2024. Of course, this does take into consideration not only what happens in the economy, but the Fed's reaction function, which has certainly been more durable than I would have anticipated. I think that's fair to say for even the most hawkish of people. One little nuance there is that now the Federal Reserve basically has complete control of interest rates by actually targeting the rate itself from what it pays, like on reverse repo, instead of changing the level of a reserve. So for example, yeah, the interest rates collapsed in 1981 in between that little peak and valley, but I don't think Volcker wanted them to decline. He, they just happened to because he lost control of, of reserves. But yeah, it's, it's totally interesting. I could see the economy slowing down, as you say, and rates cuts happening next year. 100 basis points cuts is a lot, but it could be more. But I also could see the economy playing out, slowing down, and folks such as yourself who are looking at leading indicators saying, recession. we're already in a recession, but I can see Powell up there on the FOMC being asked questions saying, look, the unemployment rate's at 4.1%. We're at 5.5%, higher for longer, stamp. It's an open book. But uh, Eric, thank you so much for coming on. It's been a blast. People can follow uh, your work on Twitter at EPB Research on X on Twitter. And then what, where's your website? And then what do subscribers get? People have heard sort of your, your thoughts here, but mm -hmm. people want the full package. What do they get? What do they offer? Thanks for having me on, Jack. And since I, I think you're the best in the business at these interviews, I fully expected you to hold my feet to the fire. I'm glad you did that. But you can go to epbresearch.com. That's where I have all of my offerings. I do private consulting for corporations and some of the companies like I was mentioning. And then I also provide weekly and monthly updates on the business cycle at various tiers. So I'll provide weekly updates on things that happen in the market, like what happened with the NFP report. And then each month, my, my flagship report is a full comprehensive review from leading to coincident to lagging. What's the economy doing across all of those stages? what's likely to happen over the next six to eight months, given the construct of those indicators and, and clients get those reports on, on a monthly basis. So you just go to EPB Research or shoot me a DM or fill out the contact form. It goes right to my email and we can set up a time to chat. Uh, Eric, thanks again for coming on and thanks everyone for watching. Thanks, Jack. Appreciate it.